All right, hi folks. Uh, excited to be here in Toronto for MLOps, and especially seeing so many people in person. It's it's been a while, I think, for all of us since we were in person. Um, so my name is Hagai Lupesco. I'm actually slight correction. I'm no longer at Meta AI. I'm now at Mosaic ML, uh, which is a startup company um, from uh, based in California, where we focus on making machine learning efficient and accessible for everyone. I'll tell you a bit more about Mosaic uh, towards the end of the talk. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about foundation models. Uh, it's an exciting emerging paradigm uh, in AI that offers both opportunities and challenges for implementing AI in the enterprise. So let's uh, go ahead and jump in. All right, so we'll, we'll take a step back in time and look at the rapid and somewhat surprising rise of uh, deep learning uh, less than just a decade ago. And you might ask, why is the rise of deep learning uh, surprising? Because today it seems like deep learning is everywhere. Uh, but um, actually, uh, just a decade ago, most professionals working on AI and machine learning considered deep learning to be irrelevant due to challenges in both the scalability and the learning instability. And actually, when I did my uh, master's um, studying machine learning, I remember explicitly my professor was an expert in machine learning, telling us, the students, uh, when we got to neural networks, yeah, don't worry about neural networks. They don't, they don't work well anyway. You. you know, just, just move on. And I think when I remember that today, you know, it sounds uh, hilarious, but that was the reality oh, just no, 10 years ago. So what happened at the end of 2012, you might ask? What happened is AlexNet was, yeah. was published. So a research team from, you know, guess where? Right here, actually, the University of Toronto, um, published a deep learning model for image recognition called AlexNet. AlexNet was a deep learning model that achieved major, major breakthrough in image recognition uh, and really set the cue for check, deep learning to check. become extremely popular uh, AI technology. Right. AlexNet actually you know, broke the, uh, the record in terms of image recognition Can accuracy and My won check. the ImageNet competition. Yeah. Cool. I think there's some noise from the other room. I hope it will stop. Um, so the AlexNet team was a brilliant research team. There's no doubt about that. But there were a few key trends happening exactly the time uh, where they were working on AlexNet that really enabled them to make AlexNet a huge success and uh, leapfrog all other teams who were competing in the ImageNet challenge. The first thing were data sets. So massive labeled data sets became available thanks to the fact that people around the world, all of us basically, started carrying smartphones in our pocket. That's, uh, you know, and every smartphone has a camera, and cameras is one of the key applications or killer applications of smartphones. Plus the emergence of the internet, the World Wide Web, uh, social media, everyone uploading images, taking images, uh, really enabled the creation of these massive uh, data sets. Uh, ImageNet is an example. That's the data set that AlexNet was trained on. Uh, it's a data set with 14 million images labeled across um, uh, tens of thousands of classes. And it was a key ingredient in training AlexNet to really a groundbreaking accuracy. Second thing that helped AlexNet was GPUs. Now, GPUs were originally designed to basically satisfy the requirements of modern uh, 3D games, video games. Uh, and for that purpose, to render 3D shapes, they had uh, highly parallel compute power, much more parallel than CPUs, for example. And uh, what happened at that time is that GPU API was actually made available for applications beyond just gaming. And now the AlexNet team was very smart. They leveraged that opportunity. They programmed an NVIDIA GTX 580, which at the time was a fairly strong GPU. And when they trained AlexNet, they trained it on two of these GPUs. They implemented data parallelism, model parallelism, which today we take for granted. But 10 years ago, it was highly innovative. And uh, with the GPU hardware and these APIs and algorithms they implemented, uh, training AlexNet on the huge ImageNet data set uh, became practical. And lastly, you know, but last but not least, algorithms. So the algorithmic backbone for deep neural network uh, reached a critical stage where training finally became stable and overfitting was uh, avoided. 
things we take for granted today, such as you know, dropout, uh, data augmentation, relu activation, layer normalization. Again, those things are kind of standard today, um, but they were very new at the time. The AlexNet team integrated all of them together into their training uh, workflow, training code, and that's what enabled the model to converge to high model accuracy. Now, all of that combined really enabled AlexNet to win the 2012 ImageNet challenge and win by a margin of about 10 percentage point, which is huge for the ImageNet challenge. Um, if you look, uh, AlexNet was the first deep learning model that actually won the ImageNet competition. And since AlexNet won, since 2012, every following year, the model that won that competition was a deep learning model. Of course, in the last few years, like, there's no actually non-deep learning models uh, that compete. Now, uh, what happened at that time uh, with AlexNet winning uh, the ImageNet challenge by such a huge margin is that uh, the potential of deep learning was realized by academia and also by the industry. And then with both academia and industry taking notice, we've seen investments in AI really skyrocketing. If you look at the chart here, it looks at private investments uh, in AI since uh, 2013. And you can clearly see the, the trend here. You know, in just 2013, investments were under $3 billion US dollars a year. And last year, 2021, investments skyrocketed up to $90 billion. Uh, that's only eight years later. So that's, that's incredible. And um, that trend is actually not stopping. It's important to also give recognition to a few uh, you know, key researchers. Now, there are many researchers that contributed to the emergence of deep learning, but there are three that are worthwhile to highlight, Jan LeCun, Jeffrey Hinton, and Joshua Bengio. Uh, again, one of them, Jeffrey Hinton, is actually local uh, from the University of Toronto. Uh, today, these folks are considered AI luminaries. If you look uh, a while back before you know, AlexNet, then actually they were considered lunatics for actually continuing to spend their time on neural networks. Uh, in recognition of their seminal work on neural network, the three of them were awarded the 2019 Turing Award, probably the you know, highest recognition for computer scientists. So today, deep learning is really everywhere. You know, the pace of advances on both research and application of deep learning has been you know, mind-boggling. Uh, deep learning works, and it works big time, and we can see it everywhere from personalized recommendation on your favorite social media or uh, video streaming or audio streaming uh, application um, through you know, know-it-all voice assistants that now all of us have in our homes and sometimes offices, um, and up to up-and-coming use cases. You know, autonomous vehicle is one uh, key application uh, that is up-and-coming. Drug discovery is another exciting one. And really, these applications are all powered at their core by deep learning. So this is all fantastic, but uh, the truth is, if you ever tried to build and train a deep learning model, you'll, you'll probably recognize that it's actually fairly hard, uh, especially if you want to get close to state-of-the-art uh, deep learning. And I want to touch on kind of why is this uh, so hard? Why is applying uh, deep learning so hard? And there are quite a few challenges. I want to focus on what I see as the three main hurdles. The first one is data. Now, as far as deep learning is concerned, it's all about the data, uh, both the quantity of the data, but also just as important, maybe even more important, the quality of the data. Deep learning requires a lot of data um, to deliver good results, much more than more the traditional machine learning techniques. Uh, with high quality and uh, high scale data, um, you're going to get good results, you're going to avoid overfitting. Now, the problem with that is that collecting, curating, labeling these data sets uh, is very time consuming and it costs a lot of money. So that's one challenge uh, with applying deep learning. The second thing is uh, models. Now, um, the increasing growth of model scale and model complexity is another aspect that makes deep learning more difficult. We spoke about AlexNet earlier. Uh, it was a state of the art image recognition model at the time. It had about 61 million parameters and took about five days to train on two GPUs. If you look today, just nine years later, an example of state-of-the-art image classification model called Florence, coming out of Microsoft, has close to one billion parameters. And it takes 10 days to train, 
uh, but it requires 512 GPUs to train in, in, uh, you know, in just these 10 days. So you can see the huge jump in the uh, model complexity um, and in the scale and cost for training such model. Um, now, the, the TLDR is that state-of-the-art models are growing rapidly in terms of both the number of parameters and the computational complexity. And with this complexity, the training time and cost rises as well. Now, the last thing, last but not least, uh, talent. So that's you know, all, of, all of you folks here. Um, with deep learning becoming more complex, model architectures becoming more complex, the software infrastructure requiring to run these training and serving wor workloads requiring more, uh, becoming more complex, uh, there's this, this skyrocketing demand for uh, experts in the field from you know, data engineers through machine learning engineers, modeling, researchers, system infrastructure. And unfortunately, the population of uh, professionals and experts in this field didn't scale up as fast as deep learning did. So the reality is that today we have a real war for talent. Uh, it pushes up both cost of employing people and hiring people, as well as the time it takes to hire. So all of this adds up basically to making advanced deep learning hard, uh, requiring a lot of time and a lot of money. Okay, so, so far in this talk, we've kind of looked at the journey of uh, deep learning from the early days, the rise of AlexNet, the success of AlexNet, different applications, also the challenges of deep learning. And I would like to introduce you to a relatively new concept, uh, a new paradigm that may be the next chapter or you know, part of the next chapter in deep learning and AI. And what's interesting about that is uh, it, it just may, this new paradigm just may actually make applying deep learning in practice easier. Uh, this new paradigm is called foundation models. So in August 2021, a group of about 100 uh, Stanford researchers uh, published a technical report where they coined the term I mentioned, foundation models. That report came out of a new st center in Stanford, CRFM, Center for Research of Foundation Models. So it's a center in Stanford dedicated just to foundation models. It's a fairly long report. It's over 200 pages long and it reviews many aspects of foundation models uh, across science, engineering, as well as society. We're not going to dive into the report in this session. It's just too long. Um, but I did want to share uh, one quote or two quotes that actually is the gist of a foundation model. And I'll just read it out loud here. AI is undergoing a paradigm shift with the rise of models that are trained on broad data at scale and that are adaptable to a wide range of downstream tasks. We call these models foundation models to underscore their critically central yet incomplete character. Now to make this a bit more concrete, a few examples of such models can be BERT, which I'm, I'm sure all of you heard of, uh, NLP model published in 2018 by Google, uh, GPT-3, published uh, two years later, um, much, much larger, 175 billion parameters. It's a language generation model that made a lot of wave. We, we'll talk a bit more on GPT-3 a bit later. And then on the computer vision side, there's Vision Transformer, VIT for short, published in 2021, very large computer vision model. Um, those are all examples of foundation models and we'll get to actually why they're foundation models and how, how they're used in that way. Um, I'd like to now try to unpack a little bit the definition to really kind of uh, provide a better understanding of what foundation model mean in practice uh, and how this so-called paradigm helps us. So there are three main properties of foundation models. Um, we'll start with architected for high capacity. Now architecting these models for high capacity is what enables foundation model to learn uh, general and high level representations of the data and that's obviously learned from truly massive data sets. That's what enables these models to be useful for many different tasks. Um, now to design such high capacity foundation model architectures, they need to leverage very deep network, tens or hundreds of layer deep, uh, as well as advanced and expressive modeling techniques. The most recent and well-known one is transformers. What this, uh, on one side, this enables the foundation models to really learn these high level representations but the other side of that coin is that it results in very high, very large models with very high parameter count, extremely high computational complexity, and that applies for both training and inference. 
Um, the table here, uh, the diagram here, shows uh, how model size have been trending for, specifically for state-of-the-art language models uh, over the past four years. And you can see here, you know, BERT in the uh, end of 2018. You can see GPT-3. You can see more, most recently Palm coming out of Google, even much larger than GPT-3. And you can clearly see the trend here. Um, now, mind you that the y-axis here, that's the model size in terms of uh, parameters. Um, in this diagram, the y-axis is actually log scale. And what this curve, the trend line here shows is that basically we're at a, you know, we're now at a situation where the model the models size uh, grows by an order of magnitude every year. And there's no sign of this slowing down. That's, I think, is incredible. Um, and it's on one side what enables foundation models to really be uh, very useful in learning high-level representations, but on the other side, it also makes them very difficult to actually manage in practice. Um, let's look at the second property, and that's pre-trained on raw data. So um, huge data sets typically uh, scraped from across the web is what powers pre-training of foundation models. And, and notice we call this training of, the, of foundation models pre-training, because there's another step later on where you can fine-tune that model. Uh, and pre-training is basically teaching these models the high-level representations. Um, now, uh, vision training data, for example, still requires labeling. Language models are typically trained with set supervision, which enables actually scaling up these data sets uh, to much larger sizes. And you know, um, if you look at ImageNet, we spoke about ImageNet earlier. Uh, it's still even you know eight years uh, after. AlexNet, ImageNet is still a well-known data set, very useful one, about 14 million images labeled across 21,000 classes. If you look at Common Crawl, a uh, well-known language data set, uh, it has, uh, the latest snapshot has 320 terabytes of data scraped from 3 billion web pages across many different languages. These are huge data sets, but they even are larger than that. Uh, as an example, uh, Google has an internal data set called JFT3B, which contains 3 billion images labeled uh, uh, across uh, 30,000 classes. So, you know, um, pre-training on broad data is another key property of uh, foundation models. Now, last property, which is what makes them super useful, uh, is thanks to foundation models' high capacity, thanks to their broad training data, these models learn general and high-level representation that can then be adapted to many downstream tasks. Now, if you consider language foundation models, um, they can be adapted to handle classical NLP tasks, such as question answering, translation, classification of sentences, such as sentiment analysis. Uh, in fact, foundation models such as BERT or GPT-3 demonstrated very impressive results, in some cases state-of-the-art results, just by adapting them to downstream tasks. So just you know, I'd like to highlight that you train a model for general task, and then you take a relatively easy step, which I'll go through later, to adapt that model to a downstream task, and that model becomes the best in the world in that downstream task. That's, that's pretty impressive. Um, similarly, for computer vision model, foundation vision model can be adapted to handle classical computer vision tasks, such as image classification, object detection, um, deepfake detection, and other types of classifications. Uh, Florence is a computer vision model published by Microsoft. I mentioned it earlier in terms of the parameter count. Um, if you look at the paper for Florence, you'll see actually Florence uh, is demonstrating state-of-the-art computer vision results in some of these tasks. Now, let's drill down into the key uh, use case for foundation models. Once they've been trained, right, which is fairly difficult step, but once that's been done and, and made available, how do we adapt them? What does adapting foundation model mean? Now, currently there are three main methods or main types of um, adaptation of foundation model. Let's, let's go over them. So the first one is fine tuning, probably the most uh, highly used one. Uh, to fine tune a foundation model, you load the pre-trained model, it was trained at some point in the past by someone, you add, typically add a layer for the task at hand, especially for classification task, 
and then you train the new model that you've got with a task-specific data set, which, by the way, doesn't have to be too large because your model already has the high-level representations. Now, the great thing uh, about this is just within a few epochs of training, you can get very impressive results, sometimes state-of-the-art results. If you look at the birth paper, for example, you see that in between two to four epochs, uh, you can get very strong and sometimes state-of-the-art results for specific downstream tasks. And two to four epochs with a standard fine-tuning data set can actually be done on modern GPUs in easily under an hour. So just imagine that. Within under an hour of training, you can get state-of-the-art results or at least very strong results. The second method, uh, which is also fairly popular, is embeddings. Now, with embeddings, you use the foundation model as a feature encoder. So that model takes in the type of input modality it knows how to handle, such as images, or text, or videos, or sometimes multimodality, text and image. Um, and the model spits out on that input, it spits out um, an embedding vector, so a dense vector that represents the input in some high dimensionality space. Now, this vector is extremely information rich, very effective at capturing the essence of your data and can be used in uh, downstream machine learning models, even traditional you know, models. This vector can be used, or another typical use case is uh, similarity, vector similarity search applications for things like search, and there's quite a bit of other use cases. That's also a fairly popular and very easy to use method. And lastly, probably the most exciting way actually of adapting foundation models is what's called in-context learning. That's the newest method of all, I would say, or at least you know, it's been effective most recently. And this is where the magic of state-of-the-art deep learning really shines. Within context learning, the model actually learns the task without ever being explicitly uh, trained for it. You just provide the task description as a natural text as part of the input for your prediction, and the model will generate the desired results based on that input. So GPT-3 has been you know, in the news very frequently. GPT-3 is one of the first models that handled in-context learning fairly well, and if you've played with GPT-3, you, you know that you can just, as part of your input, you type in the prompt about what you want the model to do, and the model just handles that task. That's, that's fairly incredible. Um, and uh, prompt engineering, which is the way of writing the input for such language generation models, is becoming almost like a new, um, you know, a new craft for many people. Uh, if you haven't tried it, I highly recommend you know, try it out on uh, OpenAI Playground, and there are other models available, including on Hugging Face, where you can play around with similar models. Um, so that's, that's the uh, third uh, way of adapting foundation model for your downstream use case. Okay, so um, you know, now that we have a good understanding of what foundation models are, uh, let's get uh, to the important point for all of you, which is what will we gain uh, by leveraging them? What's the opportunity at hand? The first one I would call out is foundation model allow us to increase the AI development speed uh, substantially. Um, when you use foundation models, so these are models that were created by someone else, often a research lab um, or, um, or a company that uh, builds these models and make them available. When you use these, you don't need to create a huge data set yourself. You don't need to label that data set. You don't need to maintain it. You don't need to train these large models. Training these large models is extremely expensive. Um, it's estimated that training GPT-3, for example, cost about $5 million, just one training. Uh, there are actually models that are larger than that, that cost even more. So you don't need to pay for all of that uh, uh, large-scale training, large-scale infrastructure. It allows your machine learning team to be much more lean and really to focus on the business problem at hand to experiment and move very quickly. That's the huge uh, opportunity that foundation models provide. Uh, second, you save a lot of money. You don't need to build and train models from scratch. Uh, you save a lot of time, but also you save a lot of the um, headcount. You save a lot of uh, compute budget. You save a lot on storage. And last but not least, foundation models really allow you to relatively easily tap into state-of-the-art AI. I mean, 
most companies are not the big fake fan companies, right? They can't afford to invest uh, a lot of time and effort and huge research teams in building state-of-the-art models. Well, with foundation models, you don't have to. You can just tap into them. Um, what's really interesting about this, it sort of levels the playing field because it allows almost everyone, you know, individuals, small organizations, large organizations, uh, allows everyone to get a leg up and kind of play the same level playing field, uh, leveraging state-of-the-art AI for their business use cases. All right, um, now it's important to recognize with, usually with big opportunities, you also have risks involved. Uh, and if you're relying on foundation models as the backbone of your AI system, you need to be aware of these risks, you need to manage them just like any other risk. First and foremost, uh, bias. Um, any biases inherent in the foundation models are going to propagate downstream for you as a user of foundation models. Uh, very important to be aware of that. Bias and fairness has been highlighted often as a major problem in AI, um, and it's a very active um, area of both research and application. What you want to do is ensure that your downstream system is tested for bias. If you find bias, you want to mitigate it. You can't rely on the foundation model to be bias-free. Second, as we've discussed here before, the complexity of foundation model is already very high and is still growing at a really uh, neck break uh, pace. Uh, it has implication downstream that you want to be aware of, even so for something like serving. At the end of the day, you want to serve your foundation model. Uh, these models become so large that it could be that the serving cost, just doing inference, is actually not going to be economically viable for your use case. Um, it could be that uh, that uh, foundation model is not even going to fit on one GPU. This is already the case for the big uh, language models, for example, and it really complicates your whole serving infrastructure because you need to shard your model. All of these things are things you want to Consider, be aware of, and just see, figure out the right way to manage. And lastly, and that's a really interesting trend, uh, is um, you know, building these models, training them, is really a, a very tall order. And it costs the companies that do that uh, quite a bit of, of money. And this actually causes these companies to try to monetize these models more. And if you look at GPT-3, which was mentioned many times in my talk, it's a great example where it's very ironic because the organization that produced GPT-3 is called OpenAI. It is open in its name. But GPT-3 itself is closed source. The data set where it's trained off is closed source. So you actually, you know, you don't have access uh, into the model. Um, now, if you're relying on that model for a key business use case, you just need to be aware that you're putting your faith in the hand of a company that may do different things. They may deprecate it, they may raise the cost, they may make changes that are going to break you in some way. Um, it's not necessarily a blocker, it's just something to be aware of. There are always alternatives, and you want to make sure your critical business use cases um, you know, uh, are relied upon in a reliable manner, and you have alternatives, and you have a, you know, an, an a exit situation um, at some point. Okay, so I think we've covered a lot of ground. I'd like to offer some final practical recommendation here. Um, so the first one is um, seek to leverage foundation model. They can be extremely useful. They can enable your company in lots of different ways, but just do it where it's useful. And one of the main aspects in my mind where it's useful is to enable your machine learning team to move very fast. Now, when you rely on closed source foundation models, always have an exit strategy. You want to control your faith. I, um, you don't want to have your destiny controlled by a vendor, um, and uh, just having an exit strategy helps you manage that. We spoke about uh, biases. Bias is one limitation of foundation model. Um, you want to understand the limitation of the model you rely on. You want to actively test for biases and then mitigate them when you identify them. And lastly, follow announcement coming out of the major AI labs, both the academic AI labs and the uh, uh, private AI labs in, the, in public or private companies. 
because that's where a lot of the foundation models are actively developed. And if you follow that closely, it's going to give you an edge because you're going to be able to ramp up on state-of-the-art machine learning faster than your competition and leverage it for your downstream business use case. Okay, so we're at the end of the talk. Um, before we wrap up, uh, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the work we do at Mosaic ML. Um, so at Mosaic ML, we recognize that at mod as models increase in size and complexity, just like we discussed earlier, training these models become more time consuming, more uh, expensive and less accessible. And at Mosaic ML, we would like to make things better by making machine learning and specifically deep learning much, much more efficient. And that's exactly why we built uh, Composer. Composer is an open source PyTorch training library. It delivers massive speed ups. You can see in the uh, charts here, um, 7x speed up on image classification, 5x on image segmentation, and then 2x on language generation, language understanding, and we're just getting started. Uh, in fact, uh, just this morning, we open sourced a recipe for training ResNet 50. ResNet 50 is an image classification model that is the backbone for many other uh, downstream computer vision tasks, and our recipe is, as far as we know, the fastest across the industry. It trains ResNet 50 within 27 minutes on just eight GPUs. Uh, as far as we know, that's a 7x boost compared to the best existing performance out there. Um, so you can check out our blog post at mosaicml.com. It has more details. You can check out Composer, our GitHub repo, where you can see our PyTorch trainer. I'd like to encourage you to check it out and give it a star. And um, the key thing is that these speed ups are not just for the sake of a speed up in a benchmark. It actually saves you precious time and a lot of GPU budget. Um, so try out Composer and then talk to us. We have a booth, talk to us about Composer and about our cloud platform, which is the best place to run our, these training workloads. All right, so thank you for tuning today. I hope you enjoyed the talk. I hope I got you just a bit curious about foundation models and the work we do at Mosaic ML. You're welcome to our Mosaic ML booth uh, where me and my colleagues would be happy to talk to you, learn about what you do, and uh, you know, have a friendly chat. Thank you so much.